Hey, if you got this part of the video, you've got the live unedited edition of Home Gadget Geeks. Thursday night, April, no, April, August 10th. I wish it was April. No, not really. Uh, April, no, August 10th, 2017. Uh, if you got this part of the video, it just means you're listening live. And if you are listening live, Dennis, Peter, Mike, if you guys would uh, let me know if you can hear me all right. Just a little bit of a sound check. If you're not listening live, which would be about 8 p.m. Central, um, you got the recorded version. That's all right. We do these every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Love to have you join us. We are in about a five-minute pre-show. So if you want, you can fast forward five minutes to get to the beginning of the show. We normally produce these over the weekend and then make them available out there at theaverageguy.tv. You can download or subscribe to them as a podcast or watch them on YouTube. The recorded, edited versions, if you want to cut out all the fluff, those are available as well. Peter says we sound good, so thanks, Peter. Let me get to you guys' site up here so I can. If you're in the chat room early, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys the site we're gonna talk about. I want you guys to do a little homework. Guys, to work on out there in the chat room. How's uh how's the weather in the Bay Area? You guys are in the Bay Area, right? Yes. Yeah. How's the how's sunny California? Is it as sunny as it's supposed to be? Yep. Yep. It absolutely is. <laughs> but right up up there. We're getting, I'm getting a little skipping from you guys from a uh, wire from, are you on a wireless connection or are you wired? Uh, we're, we're on a Wi-Fi connection. Is there, is there any way to run a cable to that thing? And, and, uh, cause I think we're overwhelmed. We might be overwhelming your Wi-Fi. Oh, that's possible. Let me check. Yeah. That's why we start a little bit early. That's okay. Once we go live, things always change. So see if we can plug a... Dennis, how are you? I'm not sure. How's the, how's the knee? It's it's doing all right. Is that all right, Tony? Is that don't 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 kill it if it's not. I just want to get the best possible sound from you. I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, I have a wire connection in this room. Do or don't. Don't. Let oh. me. Uh, I've got. I got way too many things turned on here. Let me just. Let me just shut a bunch of stuff down. Yeah, shut some stuff down because it had been oh, really good. Back. It had been really good for. Yeah, it might be the we... team viewer. I, I run team viewer to show show the network. Oh yeah, that's that's a little bit of a hog. Yeah, let's try turning that one off. It'll take a second. Yeah. Let me do me a favor. Uh, let's reset the connection. So if you would drop and then come back in, that'd be awesome. Okay, so just leave this. Yeah, that, that'll reset the connection for me. I'm getting a little little audio artifact from you. So if we could we could drop the connection and come back, that'd be awesome. All right. Hang tight, guys. Then it's good to hear that your knee's doing all right. It was your knee, right? I, thought that's what, I think that's what I saw. Looked pretty nasty <laughs> to me on Facebook. So, all right, let's try that. Tony, how's that sound? How do I sound to you? You guys sound good. How do we sound? Yeah, good. That's better. Okay. I know not to do that now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a band. It's band. Wi-Fi isn't the best thing in the world for video. So, but for me, as long as the audio is good, I don't worry about it too much. Although I wouldn't, it'll, you know, as we do some screen sharing and stuff, it'll affect it. So just another minute here before we get started, I have a few more jump in guys. Welcome. Good to see you guys out there. I dropped the, uh, the link to the topic. Uh, Moro data is what we're talking about today. And if um, the link's out there, if you guys want to go out and do some homework before we get started, we're going to, before we get started, um, we're going to, we're going to do a little bit of NAS history, which is kind of cool. We've got, we've got one of the guys that has, was out there before anybody, well, a lot of people were out there talking about it. So excited to get a little, get, do a little bit of, of, uh, of data geekery here today. That's what I'm excited. About. Paul, not too many people will get geeky on data like we do. So you, you've, you've come, <laughs> you've, you've caught the right audience. We're pretty nerdy that way. All right, great. All right, I think we are set. Emily, welcome. 
couple more to jump in chat. I always like to give it a, an extra minute just to, to get them here. They always show up just a few minutes late. Give it one more second. Hey, Emily, good to see you. All right. Let me get my notes. You guys ready on your side? Yep. Yep. Okay, one sec. All right, I have a little a little opening bit that I do. Hey, we will have you maybe bring your camera down just a smidge for me, if I could. Just get the – there we go, perfect. Yeah, just a little bit. There we go. Get your heads a little closer to the top so it doesn't seem like you're – there we go. Perfect. And you guys, let me, let me frame this up really quick. Yeah, you guys look great. You're framed up perfect, so. Cool. All right, hang tight. I'll get things opened up, and then uh, I'll introduce you guys. Here we go. This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 322, recorded on August 10th, 2017. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in a beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. We've just had a string of days. Typically in August, it would be awful here in the state of Nebraska, but... As we're getting ready for this this eclipse coming through, we have some beautiful weather ahead of it. Of course, we post this show with the world-class show notes at, at TheAverageGuy.tv. Don't forget, you can also join us on the mobile app. A lot of you are doing that now. If you just want to jump in and get right to the podcast or listen live, you can get that available on your iPhone or Android device. Easy way, easiest way to get it, HomeGadgetGeeks.com. We'll get you there, the big buttons to get it done. Don't forget, we're commercial-free now on YouTube and Spreaker as well. And if you want to support the podcast and all the things that we do, you can go through our Patreon link. It's now available at theaverageguy.tv. If you just look for the Patreon link on the right-hand side, then don't forget we're anti-Amazon now. Not really, but <laughs> they've kicked this out twice uh, from, from the affiliate marketing program. And uh, and so some of you asked me this week, hey, where'd the, where'd the link go? We had to take it down. I took it down. Didn't matter anymore. And so if you want to, if you want to support the show, do that through Patreon. We appreciate that. All right. We've been talking about the show for a couple of weeks, excited about it. And um, we're excited about it because we're going to talk about storage. And if you've been listening to the show for any length of time, you know that uh, my background comes out of the Windows Home server. But today we've got with us uh, two individuals, one, the original founder of ReadyNAS, uh, uh, Paul. Paul, welcome to the program. P appreciate you coming out and, and doing this. Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm excited to be at the show. You bet. And then, then Tony's with us as well. Tony's his, side, his sidekick, we'll say, for the evening tonight. And uh, and we'll, Tony, you'll provide the comic relief, right? You're gonna you're right. gonna tell the you're gonna set him up. Paul's gonna knock him out. Is that what we're gonna do? Pretty much. Yeah. My job is to make him look good. That's it. That's well. I don't think tonight you'll have to work too hard. Uh, <laughs> we we in a in a little bit of a pre call, uh, we kind of sat down and and Paul kind of talked me through the history. Um, his history and all the things that that he has done. Paul, what I'm most interested in, you know, so ReadyNAS was a product that's been out there for a while. And so what I'd love to do is just kind of ask you the question of how did you get there? When did you get there? And why did you get there? Like, what were you, what were you thinking in those days? It was early, you know, NAS devices were, you know, not a lot of people used them or knew about them. Certainly, they had not made their way into the home for when when you got the when you got started with it. But take us back to the beginning. What got you going with Ready NAS, and why did you do it in the first place? Sure. Uh, in my previous life, I was actually a chip designer. So we designed processors, fairly large processors, and we had to use. Um, a lot of big files, many, many files. And we have to find a secure place to store it and be able to share amongst a group of engineers. So we use NAS. And at that time, NAS was very, very expensive. Uh, the NAS we used was from NetApp. It was a $60,000 box. Mm -hmm. So you know, as a user, so I appreciate all the good things that you know, a NAS will provide you, be able to share on the network, you know, very large storage. And 
uh, it's very secure, it's very durable. And then something happened. Um, as you can see, once in a while, some technology would happen and kind of provoke your thinking about the things that you do, right? So at that time, um, if you still remember IDE, Parallel ATA, uh, that the 40 pin, 16, uh, 40 pin connector, 16 pin bus, and all that stuff was about to be replaced by SATA. And with SATA, with the differential pair of you know, differential signals, uh, transmit, receive, we actually could get higher bandwidth than all 16 pins of parallel IDE bus can give you. So that was very interesting. Uh, so that technology was coming out. I knew that uh, SATA drive was, you know, at that time was going through uh, early re releases. What also was happening, which is the availability of gigabit ethernet as a lower priced network interface. So you put these things together, SATA. Okay, now I finally I have a way to do, uh, you know, drive trace easily, hot swap, etc., and gigabit Ethernet. So wow, I can do that sixty thousand dollar box basically in a smaller box, and you know, uh, probably very cost effectively. Did the did so the chips that was the beginning of. Yeah. Paul, did the, did the chips that you were working on at the time, you know, you said you kind of get in, you got into this on chips and did that have any influence on, because you, uh, you know, the, the, the power consumption in the chips kept getting less right. and less. Although right. in those days, we look at those chips that you guys were originally working with and they're big power hogs today, right? right. When we think about chips, but right. did the chips that have an influence uh, on you as well as thinking about now you have these new drives that you can that you can hot swap and and we have lower power chips. Was that like the, like peanut butter and and um, and chocolate? Two great tastes that taste great together. Yeah, so I have to mention I have to mention the third component, which is uh, the processor, right? In, I mean, with the NAS, basically it's a dedicated computer. You need a processor. You need all those uh, DRAM and all that to run uh, Linux, etc. So I was a chip designer. And I just decided at that time, well, OK, to do this small form factor NAS, I was looking around for a processor that I could use. But I very quickly decided that there was nothing powerful enough to do the kind of stuff that I would like to do, which is to be able to do RAID, um, you know, handle gigabit at, uh, at a wire speed and all that. So I said, why don't I design a chip? <laughs> So, uh, so we our first project was actually a the world's first network storage processor with SATA interface and with gigabit Ethernet all built in. It was a very aggressive project, and we did it with uh, with the ASIC approach. We use NEC as the foundry. Uh, the processor architecture we chose was actually, if you uh, remember, in the early days of Sun Microsystems, they had the Spark architecture. Oh, yeah. With all that beautiful register window and all that stuff. It was just, you know, it's just great for doing RAID processing. So, and we just decided to uh, use the Spark. Spark is an IEEE, Spark instruction set is an IEEE standard. So you could take that without paying any royalty and all that. And we, we use the Spark instruction set, add the MMU, do the cache controller and all that together with the SATA interface, Gigabit Ethernet interface, and our own dedicated RAID logic. So RAID is mostly done in hardware. And that's how we get, remember the, the we were the chip at that time, you know, it, it doesn't have all the advanced process technology of today. So it ran about 280 megahertz, which is a far cry from today's, you know, yeah. gigahertz, yeah, right? For sure, for sure. But 
with 280 megahertz and also with multiple Spark processor inside to do to handle different tasks and the RAID controller that we have, RAID hardware, we were actually able to do four channel of SATA coming in, RAID processing, and all that. Uh, I would have to say, you know, after we did this ship for about a good six, seven years, we don't see any other chip, any other general purpose processor that can be the performance of this one, even at a much higher clock rate. So that was the challenging chip project we did as the first step of creating readiness. And, and what year was that? When Let's, let's kind of set a stake in the, in the timeline. Yeah. What year was that? OK. The year was very interesting. We started the company in the year of 2001, about three months before 9-11 uh, happened. So, and this is my third startup. And I would have to say the first two were so smooth that I didn't learn anything, <laughs> although they were also successful. I really didn't learn anything compared to what I had to go through on this one. And, and what had you done for the first two? What were those, what were those two those, startups? Those were all chip designs. I, okay. I was in uh, audio and multimedia uh, chip designs. Okay. So, um, so on this one, because you know you have to go through a very difficult uh, financing situation. You know, you just have to be very resourceful, and and doing the chip design wasn't exactly the easiest, uh, you know, project from a technology as well as finance financial point of view. So to be resourceful, to be to be resilient, it's very character building, and and thus I always when I share with people. I always encourage people to do some kind of a startup or you know be on your own. So so it kind of it builds character, right? It, it matures you as a person. Mm -hmm. And I learned almost everything I know today from that startup. <laughs> so in with 2001 with the with 9-11 happening, and then the, you know, really the 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 internet tech bubble had kind of was showing some signs of weakness. If not, it was already declining when this already happened. already bursted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it kind of a double whammy. So getting started, not a lot of funding. How do you how how'd you how'd you kind of get through those times to get it going? I mean, it, it it seemed like everything was failing at that point. How'd you keep it rolling? Yeah. So I got some angels who kind of believed in me because that was my third startup. So I had some track record that definitely helped. Um, and also I, I funded part of it myself. Um, however, it was very difficult. I mean, because you know, no, everybody in the investment community kind of froze. Uh, it wasn't that hard in 2002 when everybody was expecting, oh yeah, we're gonna blow over this in no time and you know, we're gonna recover. But in 2003, when that's when people saw no end to the tunnel, it was that bad. I mean, people would meet up with you just so that they can, you know, some of the VCs would meet up with you so that they can just write their weekly reports, right? <laughs> but with no intention of investing. So it was that bad. And uh, it wasn't until early 2004, finally, we got Series B. Hmm. And uh, it was... It was a very educational experience for me. Yeah, well, and probably faith building, uh, to say the least, right? You have, of holding on. Yeah. When when you first rolled, were you mostly thinking in the enterprise space? Uh, most of our listeners today kind of know the storage around that we do in the in the home space. But were you focusing on the enterprise, or were you trying to to do much for the consumer? No, no. On the right from the beginning, we know we want to do a desktop NAS for the smaller guys for the you know, we, we see the, the uh, digital camera coming up, a lot of photography, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, professional amateur pro photographers having access to the same camera, and they are producing a lot of photos, uh, even some home video guys are showing up. We know, we know from an application point of view, we know the market should be there. You know, every VC we talk to would tell me, Oh, I could use one at home. <laughs> you 
you know. So we know everybody needs this. So the bank was very clear. The desktop NAS, a large uh, trusted place on the network for you to keep your most uh, valuable data. That's what we would we set out to do. Did, did you find, even though you were con concentrating on the consumer market, that like small business, I think video production shops, photographers, did you find those were your most of your customers in those early years? Yeah, we definitely established a beachhead with the photographers. Uh, we were just loved by the photographers. Uh, they were looking for a place that's bigger than the USB drive, uh, faster than the USB drive, more reliable than the USB drive to keep their data. And we just came in. Uh, it was interesting. There was another company doing uh, the same thing, almost it's at the exact uh, time. And uh, that company's name is Buffalo, mm -hmm. Buffalo Terror Station, if you remember that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you, I was kind of, you know, right about to announce our readiness product, Buffalo announced their product. Um, I still remember Terra Station, one terabyte, four times 250 gigabyte drives, right? Four times 250 gigabyte, except theirs was, uh, were uh, IDE drives. They, I think they started with IDE drive. Oh, uh, 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 later on, they also moved to SATA drives. So, and what was most, uh, was kind of, uh, demoralizing for me at the time was they announced that one terabyte at $999. And that I was hoping to get a better margin for all our chip design, all our efforts. So I was going to price our product as $1399 and they are $400 below. That was demoralizing. But in retrospect, now very quickly I realized uh, that was the best thing that happened to us. Because with 999, one terabyte, Buffalo Terra Station overnight created a fast growing NAS market, desktop NAS market. And together, not hand in hand, but you know, together, Ready NAS and Terra Station, one on performance and features, the other one on price, we just together created that market very, very quickly. So, uh, and, and my strategy, marketing strategy was, uh, you know, oh, as long as a, a reviewer wants to review product for, for a product comparison for a new category, we just send them a box. And we, of course, we win every review. So they sell at 999, we always sell at 1299, and we coexisted uh, very well. Yeah, yeah. So that was one interesting aspect I learned about uh, business, which is, um, Add sometimes to have somebody, you know, uh, to be in the battlefield together with you. Yeah. Yeah. We know when businesses get out there alone, they also get slow and sloppy. And so it, uh, you know, having somebody else to kind of look to see, hey, they're doing this. We got to think about doing that. They've added this. The consumers kind of pick up on it. What year, what year was that launch uh, for you? When, when, we, yeah, we launched in 2005. Yeah, because we began, I mean, I think um, I, I began looking for and thinking about the home network, um, those that 2004, 2005, I remember some of those products, but uh, but really got interested in the Windows Home Server product, which sure. Microsoft tried to, I think, capitalize. It may have seen what you guys were doing uh, with the desktop right. NAS. I think, I don't know what your Drobo was out there. They've been out a while uh, working in this space. I think that was later. I have to I have to look that one up. With those guys, six, yeah, six, yeah. But they all kind of come. Uh, I mentioned to you, we have a lot of listeners that have the Synology device or the QNAS. Uh, I'm sorry, Q QNAP. There we go, QNAP device. Um, that's available. What was the for you? What was the point when you knew you made it? What was like? You know, certainly um, there had to you had to feel maybe not, but do you ever feel like at some point we're in this is working? You know, you can kind of rejoice and kind of have a party that like, hey, ready NAS is is going to make it. It's going to live. 
Well, we were a very technology-driven company. So when we first came up with and, and released the X-Raid uh, technology architecture, you know, X-Raid is expandable RAID. Uh, and that was unique to us. Uh, nobody else had it. Everybody else had to, you know, kind of migrate from RAID 1 to RAID 5. And then, and then you know, to, when you add a drive, you have to re-go through the mi migration of the, all the downtime and all that stuff. But yeah. with X-Ray, you just, you know, it's as simple as be able to insert that disk tray and then you get your expanded volume. Right. So X-Ray was so unique that everybody loved it. And then at that time we knew we, we were a, ReadyNAS was a winner. Um, and and X-Ray concept uh, was, you know, continue on for a very, very, very long time. And later on, when when the processor got so powerful, when the 486, I mean, x86 got so powerful, uh, all that, you know, you don't need, uh, even you can do RAID 5 migration with software fairly smoothly, then X-Ray, you know, doesn't hold that advantage anymore. But X-Ray was very useful for a long time. Paul, you, you made a statement so, earlier that hardware RAID's better than software RAID. <clears throat> You, you right. made that statement earlier. Why, why is that? Why you know you would think either or, but why is hardware better than software? Well, that's not true anymore. But at the time when software, you know, was a CPU was not as powerful, definitely hardware rate was you know make you do that migration a lot faster, and just uh, as, uh, you know when you when you had a uh, uh, volume expand your volume, you definitely want to. I'll make that as quick as possible. And with the X-Ray, it was almost instantaneous. So at some point, though, someone came, someone came calling to say, uh, hey, we, we, we may want to, you know, look, we may want to acquire the, the project that you had. When was that? How did that go? How did that feel to, to sell a company um, to Netgear and, and, and why? So in 2007, uh, Netgear also announced their own storage product. Um, so they announced a storage product called SC101. It was a it was a not exactly a NAS. It was more like a, a DAS on the network kind of product. Um, initially, they also do well because their the market was there to 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 take on uh, big storage. Um, however, very quickly they ran into a lot of support issues, you know, not working well, et cetera, et cetera. So they, since they are in the market, they understand the, the dynamics of the market, the size of the market, the potential of the market. So they quickly looked to us. They, they knew we were uh, one of the leaders in the marketplace. And they, they approached us. They knew the potential. And... Our perspective, um, we would like, you know, one of the goals of the team was really to see the technology being used by a lot of people. I mean, today I, 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 I take great pleasure when I see somebody at random places, you know, talking to them and find out they are readiness users and, <laughs> and their readiness still working after, you know, nine, 10 years. It just gives us kind of great pleasure. Or you know, you go to Fry's and see your product selling on the shelf, and that's that's just great. So what Netgear has brought us is uh, a worldwide channel. Merge with uh, Netgear, it grew very very fast. Um, very quickly, ReadyNAS became the number one small medium business NAS desktop NAS. Later on, we expanded our line to include. Uh, Rackman, 1U, 2U, uh, plus other larger devices. It, it is interesting as these, because uh, you mentioned the 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 one and two U devices, as these kind of home storage devices have grown, they they have migrated into the enterprise. I'll be honest, I would have thought it would have gone the other direction that you guys would have started large, always easier to sell, you could get better margins in the enterprise. I, I you know the. Working in the consumer market can be really, really difficult. And uh, yeah. you, for a decade, you lived that with storage. I've watched this market for the last 10 years. 
it's finicky, it's complicated, the support is difficult. You're talking about people's data, right? The, which right. someone puts all their pictures on the device and the device right. fails, <laughs> right? I mean, sure, they should have backups and all those other things, but it's always a, it's a, always a really a super kind of personal um, got to feel yeah. pretty good. I just, uh, it's got to feel pretty good for you. I was just out at Amazon and uh, put in ready NAS and there's just a ton of product there. That's co-branded, right? Netgear, ready NAS, um, kind of powered by, so to speak. Right. And so there's a lot of, that's gotta be pretty cool. I don't know. I've never had a product that's made its way to Amazon. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's gotta be pretty cool. Uh, and, and, a, and a pretty, pretty big um, variety that's out there. So the channel, you talked a little bit about the channel, about production. Have you come, is that completely, have you, have you completely handed, are you, are you out of that completely at this point with, with Netgear? Uh, yeah, I'm out of Netgear. Uh, you know, I've left Netgear um, more than five years ago. Uh, you know, on a personal reason, my, my dad got sick. And so I, I, I just, you know, decided to, to retire and take care of him. And thank God he, he was all okay yeah. uh, after a while. Anything so, you would have, Paul, anything you would have done differently? Um, it, it, when you think about your year before we, before we go forward now, anything you'd have done differently in those years, thinking back of like, man, I really wish I would have done X now knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, should we have so to Netgear? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, we merged with Netgear in 2007 and guess what happened in 2008, you know? So, uh, so you, you never know. Right. I mean, but but desktop NAS was a strong market. Uh, it, it continued to grow uh, when we were were at uh, Netgear. But I'm, you know, Netgear is a good company. I enjoy my time over there. Uh, I stayed, I stayed um, almost five years there, and, and continue to grow the business and to you know grow it to be number one in SMB NAS. So so it was a very very good experience. Yeah, so so um, Dennis in the chat room says he has a two bay ready NAS that's eight years old and is working just fine. <laughs> what model is that? He'll 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 throw that in there. They're about thirty yeah. seconds behind. He'll it's probably it. a duo. It's probably called a duo. Could be a lot yeah. of consumers get in on that two bay, right? We've seen QNAP has one of those now. Synology has one of those. Right. Um, and those those two bays are really handy. It's a it's a good entry point for for a lot of folks. Uh, to jump in. Drashna also says in the chat room, oh, 2008, what a year. Yeah, let's not <laughs> remember those 2008, 2009. Those were some awful. Um, yeah, he says, Dennis says, yes, that's what it is, whatever you said. Right. Um, so our, our very first model before we merged with Nikita was called the ReadyNAS 600. And that is very, very old. It doesn't have the best uh, industrial design, but it's just rock solid. So I don't know why the power supply still works after all these years. <laughs> so you're you telling Dennis, you're telling Dennis he better he better make sure that data is backed up. Well, the first thing that fails would be, I would say it would be the uh, you know, of course, you know, the drives you need to replace, but we have such a nice, you know, rebuild algorithm. So you can just continue to not only rebuild the drives, but also you can upgrade to larger sizes. But the power supply, uh, you know, it's not built to last forever. However, you know, whatever we did, we did it right. And, and those, those boxes just last a long time. They just, they just keep hanging around. And that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's a good thing. It's, it's yeah, interesting. I think, I think we, use the, we use the best capacitors. That's probably why. Yeah. yeah well, that's good. That, that builds customer loyalty. You know, I've... I, I can't tell you those products that I have sitting around that just work, continue to work. That it, it is one of the problems with technology though, right? I mean, you get any more longer than three or four years and the functionality, even though the hardware still works, you might have trouble with apps or with the OS or the company is gone or, right? I mean, they just don't, they don't survive as long as they used to or they change or they pivot so fast that sometimes that you just can't get support for it anymore. And so it's not like a car, you just keep driving. Although maybe for some people they can. And then for some, you know, sometimes firmware doesn't come forward and so that doesn't support the larger drives. Did you think 
uh, back in 2001, when you were kicking off Ready NAS, do you think there'd be a day when we'd be talking about, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 terabytes inside a NAS box sitting on somebody's desk? Did that, do you ever think that'd be a reality? <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, you know, those are, you know, those are sizes even at the time. So, yeah, but now, now everything is possible now. Yeah. So the mindset has changed. Yeah. Yeah. No, it has, it, it has indeed. And of course, hard drives continue to get at these ridiculous sizes. Do you think, uh, you know, I hear a lot of consumers and you're in this space, this isn't necessarily related to what you do, but because you're an engineer, I'll ask you this question. Do you think as, large, as hard drives get larger, I've heard a lot of people concerned about having that much data in one place, like on one drive. And they think it takes a long time to get it backed up or it takes a long time to get it to the cloud. Do you think there's a spot here where we've maybe overshot on hard drive spaces where they're just bigger than they need to be at the moment? And are they, like the demand or the bandwidth needs to catch up? Yeah, I would say the bigger the drive is, and if every all the data is on that drive, then the risk is higher. Yeah. I mean, you know, before the show, we were joking, right? I mean, you can part with your money, but you can probably cannot part with your data. And and now a lot of people just have data on one drive. And that is, you know, very dangerous. It's super easy, right? Just buy one drive and back everything. Right you know, buy one six terabyte drive and for the average consumer, they can back everything up to it and then not think about, we're gonna talk about this some more when we talk about your new company, but they don't think about getting it to the cloud or getting it backed up or right. getting it in a spot where they can, and you know, there's some, there's some complications because we're creating larger and larger files now, way larger than we used to. Um, you know, when we think our video production, some of our audio stuff, some of our, our photos, right? I mean, it's just, the data's the data problem is just larger. And RAID can give you false security. You know, um, the the scariest thing about RAID is that uh, when one drive fails and you need to rebuild that drive, and then you find out drive number two has a hidden error, gone. Yeah, that is. You know, that is why you use RAID 6, you know, if you have more than, you know, four or five drives. Uh, so, so RAID is there to, for, for reliability. However, uh, it has its uh, risks in the way it's designed. And the larger the drive it is, the scariest, the scarier it gets. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think for a lot of people, and we see this a lot, you know, it's just you have to be careful. As these drives have gotten so big, it's almost gotten ridiculous. We used to celebrate the, oh, the two, now three. Now at the six and eight, you know, you're kind of like, uh, maybe, I don't know if we have if we necessarily need them that large, at least at the home. Now, the, mm -hmm. enterprise, the enterprise might be a little bit different, but um, it is. Um, hey, Tony, you doing all right over there? We haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah. I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate. I appreciate you holding on, Tony. Let's sit here and look pretty and not. Yeah, Tony, <laughs> let's engaged. let's get to know you a little bit. We've heard a lot about Paul. Just give us a quick, a little quick. How did you get involved in storage? What's your story to get there tomorrow, Data? For me, I actually came from software development. I spent uh, 15 plus years developing software. The latest project I was working on was actually in uh, data asset management. And so from that perspective, we were heavily involved in, in storage. Uh, we did create a um, data management tool for managing files. And you know, the biggest question was always, uh, you know, how much storage do I need? And then for our customers, they started out, we, we actually were dealing with photo files, but then at the same time, they started to bridge into uh, video files. And then, so then we also started to look at the problem of dealing with uh, bigger and, 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 and bigger and bigger files. And a real question for them was that these, people, th these type of uh, enterprise applications, it was the enterprise space, was not just storing the data, but they actually had to move it around. And so they had to transport it between t uh, different places, had to be accessible to different folks. And so, uh, that was a big piece about how to store, how to how to scale that data was was really a big deal. 
and then how to have that place uh, that data in multiple places at once, and then how to secure it. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds very similar to what to where you're at today with this oh, yeah. product and what you guys are trying to do. So that's it's, that sounds like a pretty good match. I have to yeah. admit, when I came across your product, um, and I forget how now it, it it showed up in an email, and I think I responded to it. It the reason I really got interested, and in, in, in you guys are a little more focused on the small and medium-sized market when we think about enterprise, but I think it could have a home use as well. I think you guys don't talk about that enough. There's probably a group of enthusiasts as we talk about this. We'll get some feedback from the chat room and see um, today. But one of the things uh, that I really liked about the product is its simplicity, its lack of a hard drive in a lot of ways. I mean, it does, but it's not like you're jamming hard drives into it, which is, which is, which is pretty interesting in itself. And then it plays in a space, uh, Paul, on the site, it says NAS reinvented. And so right. talk to me a little bit. When you say reinvented, Paul, what do you really mean by that? I mean, how is it that much different from what you were doing at, at ReadyNAS? Yeah, so so ReadyNAS and NAS in general uh, is very useful. I mean, it, it sits on the network. It can be shared by people. It's very high performance. However, you know, you do have to maintain the hard drives. Um, you have to back it up if that holds your primary data. And sometimes uh, you think it's better to do off-site replication. And if you have two offices that need to share data, oh, then it gets very complicated. You know, to replicate two NASs or three, you know, in between two offices or three offices, it becomes an IT nightmare. So understanding all those problems and you know uh, what causes it. Um, also, with the advent of cloud storage, it just made me rethink, you know, what NAS should be like. The NAS interface is great because, you know, it's very fast, it's local, shared by a group of users, you know, it's great collaboration. And even for single user at home, you know, it's just so easy to use. But all that dry maintenance, you know, so I have a concept, you know, that Remember I said uh, SATA was the emerging technology that kind of got me thinking? The new emerging technology that got me thinking again is object storage in the cloud. You know, if you use Dropbox, whatever, chances are you already use object storage. And object storage is beautiful in that it scales very easily. Uh, it's, you know, the cloud is reliable. So naturally, NAS becomes, well, why don't we turn the NAS upside down? You know, you still keep the interface, but vaporize all your hard drives into the cloud. You know, the media, the spinning disk is gone. It's all into the cloud. And in the cloud is the object storage that you can scale, you know, uh, unlimited. And you don't have to do the maintenance. You no, know, there's no hardware failure anymore and all that. But how do you keep the keep the performance? You know, then you you use a cache in our cache, uh, you know, cache drive, and then the cache uh, shouldn't be too small. So you know, you have to go to cloud all the time. So we choose to use a one terabyte cache to start with, um, and everything you in interact with this one terabyte cache, you feel like you are working with a NAS. There's no difference. The interface is exactly the same. The performance is probably even better because you know we have uh, versions that use SSD, uh, so it could be even faster. And what you don't know is the NAT, the cache will upload the files to the cloud in the background. Now, this is very interesting in that. If you just use cloud storage as is today, uh, like Dropbox, your your the performance you feel is pretty much depends on how much upload bandwidth that you have. You know, we all have the experience of waiting for the upload to complete before you know I can take my computer away. Now, with a cache drive, all you have to do is just shuffle the file into the cache drive at gigabit speed, and then you're done. 
another box, you know, do the hard work or retry for you. So it's in a way that, you know, I was describing in two ways. One is versus the traditional NAS, you don't have to do the drug maintenance. You don't have to worry about uh, getting another box when you run out of space. And versus the today's uh, conventional cloud storage, the performance is just tremendously faster. You know, if you if you have 10 megabits per second upload today, then at gigabit you are 100 times faster. So all those things seems to make sense to do an upside down NAS or you know at NAS you level up, right? But this is not the end of it. Uh, we also I also knew that you know the replication between multiple offices was so such a hassle. And like you said, you know, we like simple IT. Everybody appreciates simple IT. So now that the data is in the cloud, how do I make it very simple so that it doesn't matter where you are, how many branches you have, everybody can share the same copy of data and accelerate it in their local cache. Thus, we also designed a uh, global file system. It's a moral global file system. And in this global file system, it handles all the synchronization of data between multiple sites. Uh, it handles, you know, all the notification which when data is updated, and then you know how the cache would would uh, would be updated as well. Uh, also, you know, it has to be robust enough to be able to handle um, multiple people writing the same file at the same time. You know, how do you resolve that and make sure you know you don't get something funny. Spend a lot of time doing that. Actually, uh, this time around, oh, we, we spent a good three years doing the R&D of this global file system, uh, plus other things, uh, just to make it work. I would say, from an effort point of view, uh, the more data compared to ReadyNAS is probably a, almost a 10x effort. Wow. You know, I mean, yeah. complexity one. Yeah, it's yeah, impressive. It's, it's a lot of interesting stuff that we did uh, with this global file systems. Then you're able to share files with very high performance, uh, with no question and all that. Yeah, we it's it's a lot like, and I compare it to uh, uh, the you know Microsoft's OneDrive, in the sense that uh, you, you have your files local. And then it it shares it up to the you know to the cloud, and then it can sync with others. But you add this other element of of, of you know additionally to it, where uh, unit can sync to unit. We're going to talk about that here in a second. I want to talk about the units, Tony. I want to bring you in because I know this is you did a great job with me when you met with me on the phone. I'm actually going to show this box because when you shipped it to me, I wasn't quite expecting this. So I opened the box, uh, well packaged, by the way. And, um, and let me make sure I've got this up on the screen for everybody to look at here. One second. Um, and so I uh, so I get the box out, and it's an Intel Nook. Like I was, I, I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting, but we, you know, the Nook is a kind of a favored device among us gadget geeks, right? It's inexpensive. It's it's uh, it's got a lot of diversity. There's a lot of things you can do with it. But but Tony, talk a little bit about. You've got three different models, so I'll show these. Maybe we can walk through a little bit of what you have and the advantages to them as we think about the, the different configurations. Sure. So, yeah, so we do have, today we do have three uh, configurations of the device, and we starting out, I think the first one you have on there is what we call the G40. And the G40 is, um, the way we sort of, these, the way we're presenting the devices is just based on sort of like how many users and how much information and what you're trying to do um, capacity wise. Um, they both have uh, the G40 and the G80 are differential in their performances. So the G40, it has a Celeron processor in it um, and then it has a one terabyte uh, hard disk drive. And that's sort of the, the main differentiate, differentiator. So it comes in at a, at a lower price, $499, uh, it's aggressive for the uh, home user. And it's good for up to like 20 users um, on your on your system. Uh, the second model we have is the G80, and that one runs on an i3 processor. And this one, the main differentiator is that it has a one terabyte uh, S, 
SSD drive in it. Yep. So the performance on this is much greater. It's also a little bit smaller. And what I like about it is that these drives, they both sort of disappear from your from your, from your your desk. I and mean, you don't really think about them. They're so small. Um, and this one we say is good, good for up to 50 users. Um, the performance on this is, is much better. And then the one that we just introduced, uh, I think is the third model there, is what uh, is the T600. And the main thing we're doing here is that we've been talking with uh, different customers. And what we've noticed is that some people just need a bigger cache drive. And this is actually more related not to the size of the data that you have in the cloud, but it has to do with the size of the files themselves that you're working with on your local network. So in the instance of uh, media entertainment, when you're dealing with video files, they're often fairly large. I mean, we're talking about half a gigabyte to a, to a terabyte. So in that, in that space, we wanted to provide users with the option of having much larger cache drives. And this is scalable up to eight terabytes. So this will give you a much larger cache. Um, if you're a home user and you get the uh, uh, T600, you're, you're, you're never going to egress, right? All your data is going to be on your local drive. Well, you never know. You don't know some of my users. Uh, I'm not going to lie. We've, <laughs> we've got maybe, some... maybe that's a challenge we'll have set up for them to say, you know, how, how in what ways are, are you blowing up an eight terabyte cache? Uh, there are some, there, there are, I think some of my listeners have 20 or 30 terabytes worth on the, you know, we, uh, Unraid is a popular or has been a popular topic here that we've used, uh, that folks have used, and and you can scale those up pretty large, right? So when you say scale it up, so so the the it says um, you said up to eight terabytes. So does it come configured with less, and you can put more in? Are those SSD? What how are, are those spinning drives? How are you doing that? So yeah, we're doing them with spinning drives at this time, I believe. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah, I mean. With this model, you, you wouldn't do anything less than you know two terabytes, obviously, because we have the one terabyte model in the in the G4 and the G80. Uh, but we wanted to to make it configurable for the for for the users. So, uh, but primarily, we're looking at folks really using up to the eight terabytes, um, just going with the eight terabytes right out of the, right out of the gate, um, because again, it has to do with the file size. So, what what we tell people is that you know a good ratio for the cache drive to cloud, although cloud is infinite. Um, we say it's infinite, uh, you know, it's a one to 10 ratio is what we recommend, just for performance purposes. Um, you wanna make sure that you're able to get your data and that you're able to see see everything. Now, what's beneficial with the cache drives, of course, and this is something that we, we find we actually have to say a lot of times over and over again, is that it's not a one to one sync, right? You are actually storing much more data uh, in the cloud, managing much more data than what's actually on the cache drive. Uh, but to the end user, you're seeing your entire file system as if it was, it was, all, it was all local. Yeah, no, a good thing to, re to remember that you're treating that, and let's just use the home version, the, the one I have. I have the 40, the G40. Yeah. Uh, so a terabyte of cached space locally, which I love because I'm creating, you know, gigabytes of worth of podcasting files, bo both audio and video. They can get up, you know, they can get pretty large. And so those are always available to me as I keep them on the device. But then behind the scenes, those are automatically being pushed up to Amazon. Let's talk a little bit about your pricing really quick so pre people kind of understand as we think about the, the the levels that folks would come in on this. Tony, how is this how is this priced and for, for the consumer, how do they approach, how do they buy this besides buying the unit? Okay, so actually what's what's great is that something has has changed for us and I think Paul will, will get into this, but you know, Originally, we had started out with using Amazon S3 as our as our primary uh, storage object storage for the users. And so, uh, what we do is we have an, an access fee um, for the device. That's because we we manage and do all the syncing for you. And then we have a and for the um, for the CloudNAS business. And this is not for the consumer. For the CloudNAS business, you would you you could use the uh, Mora storage. And so it's thirty nine dollars per terabyte. With the access fee at $89 starting, you get one terabyte of Marl storage, uh, storage and egress download. Yeah, However, so that's, uh, oh, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so I was going to say, so on the business side, uh, you've the big change that you've made with the announcement of this integration with Backblaze, though, is I think you've made it really attractive to the home user when we just think about the cloud NAS. So can you talk a little bit about that plan? Right. So that's what. Yeah. Exactly. So. What happened is that Black, Backblaze recently um, rolled out a product. So last year they opened up their, their product to have an object storage as well. And so their price on the storage is $5 per, 
per terabyte uh, per month. But what's even more aggressive from them is that they've dropped their egress prices down to two cents a gigabyte. So for you to egress um, one terabyte of data, it's two dollars, two dollars a month. Twenty dollars. Sorry, twenty dollars a month. Sorry. So, but the benefit of that is is that at the after five dollars per terabyte, the storage costs have, have really come back down because you know Amazon's at twenty bucks. So really, we're at uh, we're at a fifth of the, a fifth or fourth of the cost of Amazon S three. One of one of the things I did while I had the um, while I've had the unit, I've been testing it for about forty five days now, um, was to connect it to OneDrive, and that actually for me that that worked out really well. I have a because I'm a Microsoft MVP, I have a fairly large, um, you know, reserve over there, let's uh, so to speak, and and so uh, while I was using you know the your original plan and it was moving to Amazon as well, you were keeping track of that first terabyte for me. I could set some drives to just go, and we, maybe we can walk through this here in just a second, but I could set some drives to say, hey, I also want you to sync with OneDrive. That part worked really well. Uh, that, that was, for me, that was a really interesting option um, to be able to push those over there in a user case scenario where I might be a big OneDrive user and would need access to those on OneDrive. So that worked out. That piece was very, very attractive to me. So. I love those various options that you guys have to be able to do that. You also have Dropbox integration. I'm assuming that's, I didn't set that up, or maybe I did, but I think it's just a couple clicks, right? And boom, it's going to, it, you can sync that to Dropbox as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we have a feature called Echo, and and um, you can go ahead and, and uh, you know, sign up for Dropbox and then put your account information into, into our software and then attach that to a share. And then everything that goes into that share will be synced with Dropbox or OneDrive. Yeah, no, it's, now, it's, it works okay. great. Yeah, now today what we've, recent, what we've recently announced last week is one is the integration with Backblaze. That was one of the targets for the prosumer. Uh, and another option that we have for, for prosumers as far as being able to cache your, your cloud storage is that we also have a plan called the cloud drive and that's really for the the home user it's a single drive use and that one you can use either dropbox or onedrive uh personal as your as your data op as your file store basically and we're synchronizing with your with your dropbox or your onedrive account yeah um Drashna in the chat room it is interesting you know uh when we think about the larger data sets this can still gets pretty pricey as we you know for users that have large amounts of data that they are uh, pushing up to the cloud, uh, when we think about cost effectiveness for the home user, for the average home user, I still think what you guys are doing at that, because I think the average home user, a terabyte's a lot of space, to be honest, right? I mean, I, 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 when we get into the pro groups for the photographers and the videographers and then the businesses, all things change, but then the pricing model changes a little bit, right? They're coming at this from a professional standpoint and they're paying money to make money where the average home user isn't. So I still think we need to be really careful differentiating when we think about your guys' plans. Those lower plans and even the ability, shoot, I was, uh, Tony, I think I was talking to you uh, when we were saying this, Microsoft just recently put out five terabytes of storage on their regular plans. That's like $100 a year. So, you know, you think, uh, yikes, that's a lot, five terabytes for the average user. If I was going to use your device here and I, and I wanted to go at that, the consumer level and then use OneDrive as kind of the cloud storage, I'm in and it's not terribly expensive. So up to five terabytes, that's a pretty good option. I want to yeah. walk, I want to walk through the, um, uh, you can do it on your end or I can do it on mine, but I do want to walk through yeah, your, dash wanna, your dashboard yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I, and I saw this comment here about the the pricing. You know, with the cloud, with the cloud NAS, our access fee is ten dollars a month. Five, our access fee is is thirty dollars a year. So with an annual subscription of thirty dollars, uh, you can accelerate your OneDrive interface. So, you know, sure you'll you'll get your five terabytes in the cloud, and then you'll have your cached uh, data locally. So that'll really accelerate. And if you're in your home, you've got like four or five users, and you've got your photos all shared. Um, you can even you can even link it up by having uh, multiple accounts on the same cache drive, the same Morrow account, just in different pools, and then you'll be able to share all your files. So that's really great. 
And then before we move on, can you talk a little bit about the technology when, uh, between syncing of devices? So you'd mentioned if I had a device in San Francisco, I had an office in San Francisco and an office in London, and I wanted to sync the two, what's the advantage with a device like this? Right. So what's interesting about this is that, you know, people often ask, what is the benefit? Because we actually see, a, we actually perceive to be, you know, cloud is this place for you to have your centralized file, right? But I think the main thing to remember is that whenever you deal with the cloud, you do so with, the, with, this, with this interface over a synchronization service, right? So Dropbox, you know, or, or your HTTP protocol, just going through a web browser, it's really just synchronizing stuff with the cloud, right? Um, so really like the way we like to talk about is with the global file system, you're centralizing your files but we're handling the synchronization with the cloud. So for you, you're actually interfacing with your data through a file server interface. And so I like to point that out. So it's not that we're pushing all the data out, it's that you're using the different drives to go to one place to grab the, grab the, grab the data. And the, and the reason this is very different is that when you're doing a synchronization, normally what you have to do is push all your files to all the different devices, right? So all your devices would have to have the same amount of storage available on them. And then when you synchronize, you go to one place and then you push it out to everywhere else. The files get copied everywhere. So there's a lot of bandwidth being generated and there's a lot of stress being put onto the main device. What's different with us is that we have a sync engine. When we do a synchronization, we don't push the whole file. The cache drives, it's a one terabyte cache drive. It doesn't hold everything. Um, but we are able to uh, use uh, through stub files. You can see everything you need to see about the files. And then you only download the file when you need it. So if you're a user in San Francisco and you upload a file and you save it to your cache drive, then someone in London does see that the file exists. But they would only download that file if they needed it. Now, the other benefit of that, too, is if you're working in separate offices, is that when you go to download that file to London, there normally with the cloud servers, all 10 would have to go and download that file for themselves. With a cache drive, the cache drive downloads it once, and then the nine other users can access the file directly over to LAN. So it's much faster. Also reduces um, a lot of your bandwidth usage. Paul, is there any, when we think about conflicts, uh, how, how are those conflicts? We, all, we know in sync there's always conflicts. Uh, it just it's the nature of the beast. How, how in the global file system, kind of how are you handling that? Right. Uh, so we spend a lot of effort to make sure you know, we handle the conflict situation right. So if two files arrived at the same time, we support versions. So one file will be saved as a version. The other one will be the, the current copy. And so we never destroy your data. The data is always there. And we also make sure that uh, the right file is synced across all your global sites. So in other words, you know, there will never be this version inside A, the other version inside B. And also on top of that, we do file locking. So if the application supports file locking, then the other sites would only see the file as read only. So through these different ways, we make sure that it's always consistent, it's always expected. Yeah. So today we do have quite a few uh, cloud storage users already. They use other other uh, solutions, and number one, they have a. Uh, there are three situations they come to us. Uh, they have a syncing problem that there is just too much congestion on the internet bandwidth, or you know within the office. Because, you know, like as um, Tony explained, you know, when you, sell, when you save to the cloud and then everybody else needs to download, that's a lot of congestion. So, uh, and also number two is the, the syncing algorithm of some of the solutions are not as efficient. And so generating a lot of un unnecessary computing either in the cloud or on the local uh, client PC. And, and those things uh, are, you know, been resolved greatly by the NAS concept. So having the NAS cache in the cache drive just solves the, all those problems just right there. You know, it's very simple IT. And then uh, for file locking, which, you know, traditional NAS cannot do at all, for the file locking, because we have our master copy in the cloud. So everything is just synchronized with the cloud. 
So we can, we know exactly the status, you know, who's using, who's open it for editing and all that. So we can do the file locking correctly. So once you do the architecture right, then things seem to become simpler. And this is what we did. You know, we make sure that we use the cache to solve the performance and bandwidth problem. And we use the cloud to solve all the sync and lock problem. So it's really a, you know, we like to say is it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. One of the things I, as I looked at this, uh, there's in the enterprise, we, we sometimes have a problem and it's getting bigger and bigger is that we're pushing videos to our end users. And those can create, especially across the, you know, uh, across the the WAN going out to pull. If you have a whole bunch of users trying to watch the video all at the same time on another service, it's got to pull all that in through your pipe. And having those, you know, having those files closer to you and available to you on in in a cache storage like this would be a lot better. Right. In in that kind of scenario, do you think how many? Uh, in in this is why you recommend you know a certain number. I think. Um, Oh, I, that that went down, but I think you have what's the first level up to twenty, and then I think it goes up to fifty. Do you are you guys right. confident that if I if I had fifty users streaming the same video from the device, it would be able to handle it in that scenario? Pete, I I killed the sound by accident. Oh, that's okay, no, no problem. If I had, let's say, You're let's say I'm on, let's say I have, you know, I've got fifty users. On the on the mid level box, and they're all trying to stream a video that's sitting in cache uh, locally. Is that can it scale up in that way? They could all watch that video all at the same time. Yeah, I think so because you know uh, we have the SSD and we also have the i three in there in the G eighty. So that 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 box is designed to do that, and you know uh, Samba is pretty optimized for network sharing yeah I'd, so i'd like to make that box my plex box yeah. to be honest with you so my i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna put this request in would you guys make the plex app available on that box because i think that would make a really that would make it it's not too different from my own plex box today as far as size goes but mine's in a pc that's you know this big and yours is in a little <laughs> box that's it right that's, so I'd, I'd kind of like that. Tony, can we run through a quick uh, demo uh, of the dashboard? And it may be easier if you just run it from your side, if you can do that. Sure. But I'd love to take a look at the dashboard just so folks get a peek at uh, what the interface could look like. Sure, I'm going gonna, gonna, I'm gonna to switch it over. So it's going to be sharing this main screen. Can you yep. see it? Looks great. Okay, great. So I'm going to log in here as an admin. And so with each account, you have your own portal, and we call these a subdomain. So the one I have in the demo here is called Bigger Inside. And I'm just going to log in and, and give you a chance to see how I've got one pass set up for here. And so once you're logged in, you're going to see a dashboard. And the dashboard just gives you an overall picture of uh, what's happening with your system. We've got, we've got some statistics down here showing you uh, how much data has been going through. I actually did a fairly large file transfer at this point in time. You can see how much data was passing through. Um, this was on a 20 megabit line. And so at 9.4 gigabytes, you're about 19 plus uh, megabits uh, per second. So it was, it was utilizing most of the pipe. And no one complained about it. No one said, oh, yeah, internet seemed really slow today. So I was pumping data through here for, 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 for a couple of days. Um, the other thing you're going to get an overview of is how your system is laid out. So, you know, like we said, we have three, we have two cache drives. The third one up here is we call the team portal, and that's the web-based interface. So because our master copy is in the cloud, you can actually access your files through a web-based uh, interface. And uh, next week, can I announce the connect? Connect. Next week, we have a desktop application that's coming out that's also got this web-based interface built into it. So you can take that with you on the go and then be able to access uh, without having to go through the, um, the, the, the website to get to those files, but also be able to interface with your, with your cache drives, um, make it easy for you to open those drives. So I've got a demo here. We've got a drive in San Francisco, a drive in London, and you can see which shares they have access to. Um, we have permission settings at the gateway and the user level. 
And then we also have the shares partitioned out into the different pools, which controls uh, where and how those files are being stored. So, you know, just, just you know, people ask the basic questions, how does it work? How do we do it? So we have all the standard features built into it. Uh, you can add users. Um, you have the standard users and then you have administrator users. Administrators, of course, have access to manage the system. What's nice is everything's centralized through the web interface. So like you've got drives in different locations, your users are in different offices. You do all that management from the, from, from the cloud. You can be anywhere. Uh, we also have groups and so you can assign users to, to different groups and then you can use the groups to do uh, uh, user permissions as well. Um, what I'd like to walk through is just kind of show the devices real quick here, how they're represented. So we have the devices as I mentioned, you can do uh, device level um, security. And so this drive has access to all of the shares. And then the London drive has access to only a couple of the shares. And I'm gonna actually open up one of them right here because we're gonna do some, do a little demo for you on that. So that share is now available to the, to the London drive. And this is what we call like a location awareness security. So you can only access the data if you're on the same network as the drive. And then finally here is what we wanted to show is the file system. And this is what we call the global file system is all managed in one place. So this is the Moro storage and we have different pools in here. The pools is where you manage how and, and where the files are being stored. Primarily right now we're managing two main features which is the version control and then prefetch. Uh, version control is exactly what you think it is. You can set up how many versions of the files you wanna keep. You can do 300, 30 or keep all versions. Uh, one of the things we like to bring up about versioning obviously is dealing with file conflicts, but also with um, the big hot topic is ransomware. Mm -hmm. So if you're keeping versions of your files on ransomware, if you do get hit by ransomware, it encrypts a file. So as soon as the file is encrypted, you've got the latest uh, best copy of a file stored inside of our cloud. So the RPO on that is, 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 is very low, right? Because that's a file you've just worked with. You don't have to go, like most people do with ransomware, you've got to go back to some kind of offsite backup. And usually that could be like, you know, a week old or something like that. Tony, uh, two things uh, we were talking about. I had mentioned to you is uh, th this was an enhancement uh, request. Could we do a one click restore everything? You know, that ransomware idea of, of, um, hey, I need to get, I, they, they took them all, they encrypted them all, and now I need to get them all back. Um, do, I, do I have that, it, would that ability come to be able to just restore them all? Yeah, that's something that I've, I've talked to folks about because one of our one of one of the customers that I work with, that was his first question was about ransomware. And it's because we're storing all the versions that that one's just strictly straightforward. Luckily, none of our customers have been hit yet. So um, but we would add a feature that says basically, hey, give me back every single file up to a certain date. Right. So give yeah. me the last good copy of file up to today. Right. And then you would get that version of the file back. You you can codename that to upgrade after me if you want, and then uh, sure, yeah yeah the gym <laughs> right or, and, <laughs> and then um, the second one is I'm assuming everything's going encrypted, right? Uh, so that, I see that question coming up too, right? So with the with the um, with the with the cloud NAS business and enterprise, the files are encrypted. So we um, on the on the moral storage. We do a few things actually. Over to the dashboard, if you would, for me. Sorry. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, I got you on the screen here. So there's a couple of things that we do. I was doing that so I could see you. It's really weird. I'm not that good. I'm not that good looking. I'm just saying. I'm not that good looking. Um, yeah. So we do a couple of things with the files, and this actually helps with bandwidth. Someone asked about uh, in a previous conversation um, today about WAN acceleration. So the couple of things that we do for the large files is that we we do we do chop them up, um, so that allows us to upload with with multiple threads. We compress them so that you don't have to store the full file size in the cloud, and then we encrypt them. And so all the files are encrypted in the when the moral storage are all encrypted at rest and in transit. Okay, cool. Now some yeah. good technology uh, behind the scenes. You have an apps tab there. Um, are you doing? You know, we think about a Synology, and there are millions of apps. Are you guys yeah, we're just, thinking about that? Yeah, we're just getting yeah we're just getting started with our apps. Like you mentioned, the the, the first two main apps we added uh, were both to the same feature, which is Echo. And Echo is really great because a lot of these storage ecosystem systems with the with the security, you know, you don't just open this up. Sorry, to anybody, I'm right? not sure. Sorry, you invoked my Echo when you said Echo. Sorry. Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll mute her. Echo, buy Morrow cash drives. Too late. I already muted it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, 
Yeah, so with, with Echo, you can share, if you've got already systems set up where you wanna, where you do share files through Dropbox or OneDrive, then you can just add those shares to, those folders to a share. And then anything that's copied into the share is then synced uh, two ways with, with Dropbox or OneDrive. And then the other app we have right now is Slack, and this is for the IT folks because there's a lot of alerts and messages that come up, and so you can add a Slack channel and then have those alerts sent to, uh, sent to your Slack channel. So you get mobile alerts for 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 all the logs. We we do logging in here as well. Yeah, for the for the real nerds, you want to go in there and and uh, comb through the logs to see what's going. on. Yeah, you can on. take a quick look. I mean, we <laughs> you can keep track no of the that are happening, any errors, uh, warnings. I didn't. I did not look at the logs one time while I <laughs> been. That wasn't that important to you, right? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, uh, Drashen is asking the question about versioning. So you have thirty and three hundred. Why not just make that customizable by X, so to speak? I could put any number in there to allow me to version that? Well, I think that for us, the philosophy, of course, is around simple IT, right? So we just want to keep it really simple. And we picked those two numbers because we just thought they were sort of a good in-between set between no versions and all versions, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and maybe Paul can speak a little bit better to the decision well, it's behind a, that. It's a month and a year, right? Is kind of what you're kind of what you're shooting for without saying it that way, right? Right. I mean, along with it, we also not only we do versions, we do very smart. Uh, we do intelligent purging. So, uh, if you generate, say, a lot of uh, edited versions, uh, we would know. Try to keep your uh, older ones, say, at a weekly level or even at monthly level, uh, while uh, keeping the most recent ones at daily level. So uh, not all 30 versions are the same. We will try to do it intelligently so that you have as much of a history as possible. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, some, so I could use some smart versioning, you know, because I just keep everything. And, uh, and so it might make sense to have some. Tony, you're showing uh, the, the managed version piece. There. Yeah, I just want to show you the versions. I mean, this is just a very simple demonstration. But if you do have versions, you can go in there and then you can just recover them based on, you know, what you're looking for. Yeah, the pr pretty standard, and that uh, that's a it's a that's a great feature to be able to go in and pull those pull those down. I, I found I went I went back through in my testing. I just went and did some stuff and then tried to recover them. Super simple. So very, very easy, very intuitive. Yeah. I'll show, I'm gonna flip over to my screen really quick and I'll show, okay. you guys have kind of the um, kind of the corporate setup. Let me see if I can get yeah. to more, just kind of the home, you know, here's the home look. Yeah. Uh, at, the, at this point, so, you know, uh, going out to the cloud, I've got the global pool. I divided it out into two separate folders. Um, if you look at my file system here, um, I just kind of created a podcast share and a video share and I actually gave um, the video share was too big. I didn't want to push that to my to my OneDrive. So I did not um, I did not share that one. I think let me make sure I did not see the echo and I might have actually taken both off at this point. But the podcast share had the had the OneDrive echo because those files are a little bit smaller Then the video share uh, was left only going to Amazon. Um, and so it just gave me kind of a way of of separating those two out in my uh, in my file system, which is kind of cool. It just represents. Let me let me show that really quick here too. Hope I'm not giving anything too much away. You never know what you're showing on these kinds of things. So let me quick. Oh, I'll share the whole screen with you there. There we go. So uh, when we look at the file system, it just comes up as a network drive. I named it Tag. And there's the files right there. So they're just available from a, from a once it's set up and connected in, it works just like any other file structure uh, that's there, and you see it just like anything else. So pretty pretty easy to use. Pretty, and you can see here here's some Home Gadget Geeks episodes that I moved over, moved some Word docs over. I brought some raw files. At one point, I brought some raw files. The test was those raw files are the biggest ones, and so I kind of wanted to see how you guys talk a lot about it speeding up things on the network. And so I kind of wanted to see how that would work. And so moved some of those bigger, larger raw video files over. And yeah, they're, they're really speedy. I mean, I think they're three or four times faster than my Drobo. And um, 
So that, that for me, that was it, it. I was getting regular network speeds, uh, which was which was pretty cool. So, Tony, if you want to flip off the show, is there anything else that you wanted to share on your side from a screen? Um, yeah, I think. Um, well, the, one of the things I did want to share, and I'm going to try this again. I know you. I know it kind of dropped out our our, our network a little bit, but um, actually, I might be able to show it here. Let me see if I can bring up this uh, shared drive here. Oops. So I, I, I think I'm not sharing it. Don't, let, let me let me get it up first before I. Sh <laughs> now you're it. sharing it right now. It's okay. Oh, am I? It's okay. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're seeing it. It's okay. I think I was sharing that whole time you were talking, so I'm a little. I, bit... no, I flipped the screen over to me. So oh, okay. Yeah. So just one of the things I wanted to bring up was that um, when 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 the file is not cached in, you see this this X. This is a good example of that. So basically, this file is not actually on this drive. And so when we double click it, it'll download that file. But to the end user, it looks like all the files are in one place. And I think that's just one of those things that's really kind of like we want to drill home for people is to be able to see that how that how that works out. And so so this is like, you know, when you drop a file in there, you're going to see it pop up right away with that stub file. And then when the users want it, they can they can go ahead and download the file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, if you're a if you're a OneDrive user, get used to this. You guys are doing it, or Mike, I should say, Microsoft is now doing it a lot like you guys are, and uh, and so they didn't do that before, and they're moving back to it. So if you're a OneDrive user, you should find this actually pretty familiar, um, yeah. the, in the way you see and, it. So yeah, and there's a couple of questions on here. I think we should um, yeah, drop back to your video for me if you could. So again, I'm not that good looking. So <laughs> um, there is that. Yes, there we perfect. go. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So um, bandwidth control for uploads. Right. Do we have that? Yeah. So <laughs> I like thoughts. Right. So bandwidth control. <laughs> we're adding a lot of stuff. I'm just not yeah. sure what we're allowed to say about what. <laughs> so we do. Uh, we do two things. We do a scheduled sync. So you don't have to sync all the time. Uh, you can decide that hey, uh, I don't need to sync in real time and sync only after 5 p.m. And or you know you sync every other hour, so you can do that. Uh, we give you a very flexible sync schedule control. And the second one is we do bandwidth limit. Uh, this one is coming out. Uh, it's not in the current release yet. But it's coming out pretty soon. So you'll be able to specify a megabits per second, and then we just limit to it. Great. Good. It sounds like you guys are iterating pretty often. Um, you've, I've had the device less or just over a month, and there's already new. I was uh, getting ready for the show, and I saw some new firmware that was, uh, or a new update uh, that was available for it. How often? What's kind of your development cycle? How often do you plan to roll stuff out, or do you just make it available as it's available? We do a uh, kind of a uh, not not real major but kind of an intermediate release on a monthly basis and then uh, probably on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to minor releases so um, so i think between 2.0 and 1.0 that took about uh, four months yeah that would be a major release yeah yeah we don't want to do it too much we're not firefox <laughs> Or Adobe Flash. Or Chrome. Or Chrome. <laughs> they just do it behind the scenes. They're like on version 10 million now. You just you don't even know it. What's um it, so if there's interest, if if folks are interested, of course they can go to uh, tomorrow data, M-O-R-R-O-D-A-T-A dot com if they want to get that. What's the best way to contact you guys if they have additional questions? Well, I mean, they can they can on the website, we've actually got a chat widget there for them to jump in and go ahead and just start chatting. Um, you'll most likely get me answering. There's a couple of folks which, who do that I as did. well. Today, <laughs> I was, I, I was uh, this morning as I was getting ready, I noticed there was that, there was the update. I, I logged into the, the, uh, the dashboard. So I was trying to think, oh, I should probably update this for the show. And it wouldn't work. And so I pinged Tony, I didn't know. I went in the chat room and, and I said, hey guys, I'm having trouble. It shows the blue thing, but nothing's happening. And so um, that was early, early this morning, uh, early for you guys, early for me as well. And then you got back to me via email. By the time I got to work, I had an email from you, Tony, saying, hey, uh, that had come from the chat service. So that's really cool. We like that. So if you're on the site and you want to get to them, 
you guys are pretty much monitoring that probably not 24 seven, but pretty close. And, and that might be a good way if they have questions or if they, if they have anything they want to get to you, they can just drop it in the chat bot and it'll take care of it. That'd be. Yep. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Someone will pick that up. Yeah. That's the easiest yeah, way. You, guys were, forms, you can fill out on the website as well. <laughs> I just go to the chat room. You guys were super responsive that way. And, uh, and that worked out, um, that worked out well for me. It, in the end, it was my fault. I had the power turned off and I had not, I, I had been messing with it before in the cloud. And this is one of those kinds of things. I was interacting with it via the cloud because my files were in the cloud. And so I was like, oh yeah, everything's great. This is still working, right? Kind of thing. And then stupid me, I look over at the switch and it had, it had, uh, it had gotten shut off. And so Tony was like, hey, why don't you just turn it on? <laughs> and imagine that. You turn it on and the update works. So that was a little embarrassing uh, to, for the IT guy to get the, uh, is it turned on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that happened to me today. And I, yes, I, I, I'll admit it. Um, well, uh, Paul, Tony, thank you for taking the time uh, tonight to walk through this. It'll... It will be fun to watch you guys kind of grow. One of the things I like doing the best is these emerging companies that have kind of new ideas or doing new things, and we get them early. And then we did this with the, with Jamie over at ring.com, you know, the doorbell guys. We interviewed him before he made it big. I don't think I'd ever get him back on my show. So we'll hope that you guys make it so big that I can't ever have you back <laughs> on the show because you'll be too big of a deal uh, to be able to do that. But We'll wish you the best of luck on that. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for staying late with me. And uh, it makes it a little easier on the on the West Coast. But thanks for doing that. And, uh, full disclosure, uh, Morrow Data did send me a unit for um, uh, for this evaluation. I'll just say that. that we have, we're supposed to write that in the blogs when we do that. But I will say that uh, here in the program. And I appreciate you guys providing that for me. And we'll, we'll shut her down and get them shipped back to you and, and appreciate the review unit and a chance to take a peek at it. So anything else that I missed, Paul, Tony, before we go, anything I missed? No, there's a couple other questions, but we can do that afterwards. Oh, yeah, we'll save for some post-show. How's that sound? Okay. So, well, Thank you, Jim. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah, oh, Paul, great, great. to. Uh, we could geek out on the story for a while. I had to I had to kind of cut it back because I thought, well, we, we, we need to cover some of the product. So I, I appreciate you going through the story. Oh, we hope to. Uh, we hope to get back on the show later, you know, in the future yeah. to, to, to give That'd you some great. update. Uh, just whenever you guys have an update you want to share, just let me know and uh, and we'll bring you back on and we can, we can cover it. So I appreciate it. Let me do a few items and then we'll go into the post show. So hang tight. Just a reminder for everyone listening, if you want to support the show, if you want to do that, we always appreciate that. And then for the, for those of you who have done that through Patreon, thanks, but you can head out to the average guy.tv. Click on the Patreon link. And a uh, dollar to five dollars, we we don't ask very much. But if you want to support the show, a great way to do it. You can also, I should remind you, that's the only way to get the post show. So we're going to answer some additional questions in the post show. We didn't set it up this way, by the way. But that post show is available only to our Patreon subscribers. So if you want to get access, both the audio or the video or both, uh, join us on Patreon as little as a buck. And each week I ship just the post show to you. Sometimes it's funnier than the show. So you might just some good stuff goes on in the post show that uh, doesn't always make the show. So if you want to do that, we appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, send me your questions or comments around what's going on. If you have somebody you want featured on here, like we're doing tonight, send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. Don't forget the AverageGuy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. And of course, you know that's Christian. Christian almost made the show tonight, and then Gary showed up and could make it so but uh, you know that's Christian for more information and plans that start as little as ten dollars a month maplegrovepartners.com and then don't forget to download the Android or iPhone app for our show as well as available for you and we thank LastPass for their sponsorship of the program they always uh, are such great partners to what we do here at Home Gadget Geeks and they of course have sponsored that app head out to lastpass.com and their plans twelve dollars a year not too bad uh, and you can find the app Home Gadget Geeks Com. We're here live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern at TheAverageGuy.tv slash live. We've got a couple great programs. Joel Rushworth is coming back. He's been on the program before. He's an MVP out of Canada. So we'll probably be talking some Windows stuff next week. But we're back live, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern out here at TheAverageGuy.tv live. And with that, we'll say goodnight, everybody. Okay. What other questions do we have in the chat room that we, will, that, uh, we need to cover here? Predictive. Um, there's a question. Yeah. Go ahead and read there's it. There's a question about predictive analysis. Mm -hmm. 
if we do any predictive analysis on the cache drive, especially as the drive fills up, wants to uh, frequently yeah. change files or? Yeah, how would you, so in other words, if you've got all these files coming in and how are you deciding what gets pushed out of cache to stay in S3 and what doesn't? Yeah, so when the cache gets full and we need to swap a new file, then we pushed out the least recently used file. You know, we just assume uh, time, uh, you know. It's a, so, it's so a we try to keep the, time stamp. We try to keep the active files, you know. Mm -hmm. So as long as your, your active storage size is within one terabyte, you should be doing very well. You should be very, the cache efficiency should be very high. As long as your active storage size is smaller than one terabyte. So and it, if it's more than that, then we kick out the least recently used. And is it just a delete? So in other words, uh, on the cache, uh, it's, it's getting ready to fill up. There's some kind of operation that then says, OK, least or last used file, you're gone. Is, that, is it as easy as that? Yep. We change the file into a stub file. So the, the, the file pointer still stays. You can still see the file, but the content is gone. Okay. So it's a very fast operation. Saving, saving quite a bit of space, depending on the file size um, as well. That's right. That's yeah, right. I, work, I work with some reporting stuff back in the day, some crystal reports, some business objects now. And they had a similar structure where they would keep the most used reports, file objects, uh, in that, in, in kind of in memory. The same kind of idea, right? Right. And so f with that idea of whoever's using the, you know, whatever's being used the most should be as far forward as possible so people can just get access to it. But in the scenario, if I do say I've, I, I have a file, it was a large video file, it got kicked out, you know, a couple weeks ago, I go to access it, it's not in the cache, it's going to have to pull that entire file down before it gives me access to it? Or, or can, it, can it start doing it in chunks? Uh, right now, the whole entire file needs to be pulled in. And is the user experience then? I click on it and wait, or how do I know it's pulling it out of it's pulling it out of the the cloud? You would uh, you would feel that it's trying to access the file, and uh, usually the application today is uh, works well with remote file repository, so you just have to wait longer. Okay. And you know, I think in most cases, your download speed is multiple times of your upload. So we, uh, in most cases, you know, unless the file size is very large, it's, it should be reasonable. Yeah, well, I was thinking, yeah. I, I unfortunately make five or 600, you know, gig files sometimes for videos. The videos get pretty big. Right. Okay. And, and so that could be a situation where that would drop out. And I imagine... That's gonna right. even at even at I've got some pretty fast bandwidth. It's still gonna take a while to come down. So just an expectation, right? right? Um, yes. Now in this case, so we'll be we'll be improving. We'll be improving supporting streaming, so you don't have to pull the whole file. Yeah, that. But in this case, let's just say in this usage case, I might want to upgrade to a big a bigger cache. If I was doing that a lot, if I was in a shop or we're doing a lot of videos. And they were a half a, or they were five hundred, you know, half a terabyte, or they were large. I might want to consider going to that to the larger um, cache drive, right? To have that local. And I'm assuming that would have the same. Okay, so let's say the San Francisco and London office scenario. And if I buy the large one, I should call it large. It's T something. We'll call it the T the T900. No, what do you guys call it? I, I can't just make up your own numbers. <laughs> okay. I, I should make up your own model numbers, right? The T600. <laughs> if I have the T600 in San Francisco, and do I have to put in, in London, do I have to put one there too to, so that they match and they sync properly? You know, if I've got, say I've got three or four terabytes of cash in San Francisco, how does that work if I have different size boxes in different locations? Yeah, different size would be okay. You yeah. don't need to. They don't need to be the same. Okay. So it would be um, Tony to your to you were showing me in the demo where one office uh, only had access to a cer certain file structures based on its location, 
and it's gonna then it's only gonna keep whatever's being lows what whatever's being used locally based on the drive size. It's only gonna keep that information in its cache. Everything else gets sent to the cloud, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, that makes sense. <sighs> that makes sense. Yeah. Have you? Uh, what's your largest? No company names, but what's your largest footprint when we think about different devices in, in different locations? Can you? Can you talk at all about that? Do you have a do you, have, do you have any companies where they're using four, five, six, ten different devices around the world? Yeah, we have a customer that that uses fourteen terabyte today, and we also are working with people who actually have five hundred terabytes. Uh, this is you know we're still working on, but there are where you know because of this cache. Architecture really makes sense in solving people's pain points. So we are getting uh, a lot of inquiries as well as uh, uh, cases from life science, from media entertainment, uh, from digital agencies. So, so we are, you know, usually when you have large files and you already are in this multi-office scenario, this is almost the perfect solution. Yeah, yeah. And how many different, what do you think is your most number of offices that you have where you have equipment being synced? Today, I think we have three today. Yes. Okay, okay. so three is the most at this point, three different office locations. Right. Yeah. Sync. Okay. Yeah. And then um, it, conceivably, if I wanted to buy a device and swap out that, one terabyte drive for because you know my guys will ask this if i wanted to put a bigger drive in there could i could i back up that drive and or is there some trickery that stops me from doing something like that yeah it's not gonna work uh you know we we believe in simple it and everything and it's your data we don't want you to you know to be too adventurous so the concept is it's, a, it's an appliance and what's nice about the design is that the cache is not a critical component, right? So if you lose the cache, that's okay. I mean, you just get a new one, and then you know all your data is still safe in the cloud. So it's it's a it's a it's a supposed to be lightweight, mobile, and you know you don't have to continue to maintain uh, or, or or grow uh, the device. The device is actually you know even with one terabyte. If, even if you have a hundred terabyte of cloud footprint, it will work. Maybe that the cache is not most efficient. It will still work. Right. So that's the the design philosophy. Yeah, you have a you have a great video. Uh, if you go out to your just YouTube and put Morrow Data in there, you have a YouTube channel. You have a great video where the guy is in the office and he unplugs it and he takes it out back and smashes it with a sledgehammer. And, <laughs> And then they just pull another one out of the box, plug it in, right? You go into the web interface, add it to the add it to the global group, right. and it'll start syncing, right? Is that it's 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 is it pretty? I mean, there's probably a few more steps to it, but it's pretty easy, right? To 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 reestablish. Right. It's it's as simple as the video show. You just add the new device, and then immediately will start the sync of your mass <coughs> data from the cloud. And in the video, it shows that uh, I think close to one terabyte, it's only about one and a half minute. The whole data is synced down. Yeah. So it's almost like instant instant recovery. Uh, we, of course, you know, we don't sync down all one terabyte, uh, but you know, we sync down all the metadata, so you can access right away. Right. That's important to remember, right? I think it says like one minute thirty three seconds. The entire like nine hundred and thirty gig worth of, of meta, in your case, this metadata, the file headers, right. the structure, all that stuff comes down and is reset. And then right. I'm assuming it's going to slowly behind the scenes start populating, or does it wait for people to start accessing those files before it pulls them down? Right now, it waits for you to access the file. It doesn't assume that you need all the files. So if you don't need all the files, it doesn't, you know, uh, incur all that traffic for you. Yeah, that's actually probably better that way. You know, mm -hmm. I was always thinking, oh, it should just start pulling down where it was before. But 
that would create probably a lot of unnecessary traffic and it it for the it'll pull it down for the first person and then uh, right. wait wait for the other ones that's um Ken had asked in the chat room about pricing and so that the G40 is currently 499 the G so and that's the that's the smaller box with the 1 terabyte spinner inside it's just an intel nook is all it's is the is the outside i really love that you guys went with that architecture i love those boxes so those are pretty cool the g80 uh which is the core i3 it's got the one terabyte solid state which that's a that's a nice that's an m2 drive that's a that's a pretty nice little drive that's worth some money right in itself right there that's we, we get excited about those things that's 899 and then the the t900 and it's really a t600 but i renamed it uh, the T, the T six hundred that's got the Xeon uh, quad core in it, and is scalable up to eight terabytes. That is sixteen ninety nine. Actually, that's still not too terrible, guys. To be honest with you, when you think about uh, seventeen hundred dollars, I was I was pricing out because of the big Bitcoin rage that's going on right now. I was pricing out. Yeah, it's less than one Bitcoin. <laughs> it's, it's a half a Bitcoin right now, to be honest with you. That's you should you should market it that way. One half of a Bitcoin. Um, I was pricing out some equipment, and man, video cards are seven hundred bucks right now for the big beefy ones. You know, so it's so your two video cards. You're the price of two video cards at this point. So you can market it. The the ten the ten eighties um, those are the those are the ones that all the the miners are snatching up. Um, but that's another big topic all in itself. These mining rigs, people, it's gotten it's gotten crazy and out of control. So Ken, great question. Um, yeah, and he said placeholders. Yeah, I'm. That's I'm. I think that's the terminology Microsoft would use when you set that box up. It's going to reset all the placeholders on the box there so people can see them so within two minutes less than two minutes it's going to put the placeholders in, in place and then as soon as somebody goes to access it it's going to pull it down make it available on cash and it'll be there until it runs out of space so that's pretty cool right so that works for data recovery and also works for if you have a new office you want to set up so all you have to do is to add a, add a new device and in two minutes yeah the data is all set yeah no, it's pretty cool. You guys, it's it's a it's a. This is like I said. This this fits our our audience really really well when we think about the home server folks. And I would have to think like, you know, the the whole goal when I was working with you guys was to say, would I as a podcaster, if I was going to invest in a device, if I was going to buy a NAS, would this be a good? This, would be this a, for me a good way to go now? I'm kind of an old schooler and I like to have all my data on site, which, so it's a little bit different for me because I like, we, you know, they say size doesn't matter, but we know it does. And so it, it's one of those kind of, we all compare like, how many terabytes do you have in your, your NAS, you know? So I'm a little bit old school, but if I was, if I was going to start with a device like this, based on my workflow, I would change my workflow a little bit the way I keep and store data and the way I do my backups. But yeah, this could work. This could work nicely for me. I think it would work even nicer in a situation where I was working locally with other. This is where I get excited about it. Where I was working with other content creators in an office, and we would just share this. That right. to me, that would be. And I would, I wouldn't go. I'd go with the G80 if if it were if I was in that office situation and doing that. That would be. And let's be honest. I really want the T900, which I renamed the T600. Um, that's the one I, I didn't see that. I don't because that's new, right? Is that within the last couple of weeks? It's new, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I should have asked for that one. Should have asked for that one. Oh, where do a T nine hundred for you, Jim? <laughs> it's that's I, I know when a special T nine hundred comes out, it'll be, yeah, okay, down, it'll be like five thousand bucks. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like yeah. you said, if you have an existing NAS too, we always joke with people say, look, that, that NAS becomes your archive, right? So you can transfer your data over yeah. and you got to keep two cop three copies and have it on two server units. So yeah. yeah. Well, well I have I have five I have five NAS at home. So you know, and, and I have to do. set up we have to set up our sync to to uh, replicate one to the other and etc. And even after all this work, I kind of forget which file is in which NAS. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. and, and with this, everything is in a single 
you know, namespace because you know it's unlimited volume, right? And so I don't have to worry about that. Everything just in the logical tree structure. Right. So yeah, and, you, and you pay for that unlimitedness. You know, you you guys have said a couple times yeah. unlimited. I I am paying for it on the back end as far as it's not. You know, the the every terabyte I go, I'm 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 paying for that storage somewhere. So right, right. Um, I want to be careful yeah. there. But it does give in a business scenario, it does give us unlimited backup or the to the cloud. Yeah. Well, you know, what, where we saw a lot of benefit too, like we used to deal with customers, like I said, in my old life, we had customers with a lot of data, right? And so they would say, okay, I got to spec out three years worth of data. Well, how do I know how much I'm going to need, right? So you got to figure out that calculation. So people either overbuy or they underbuy, right? Overbuy is terrible because you're paying above that curve that whole time for that storage. Underbuy is actually even worse because now you've got to expand. Right, unless you're paying for one of these expensive arrays that can just tack on storage on the back end, expanding your NAS is a lot of trouble. Uh, so you know, we we were helping customers along the way. That that's why you know you're asking what I was doing before. I mean, when Paul told me about this this device, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I just all these problems we used to deal with, all these frustrations, just in my mind, just dropped away. Um, yeah, and your your bank and and we know the cost of storage continues to get cheaper. So it's it's not like you know it just keeps getting you know it keeps getting cheaper and so right. you're kind of hedging and and I know a lot of customers they don't want to mess with the drives I mean I I do I like that part I mean I love the <laughs> I, I'm just it, you know I just I love having I love I was just messing around you know behind me is the, there's a Drobo right here you can't see the lights but right there there's a Drobo and it's sitting on top of a Windows Server 2016. That I still keep around because I'm sentimental. You know, it's like, oh, I have server essentials, and I can, although I don't back up my PCs to it anymore. Uh, I, you know, I do different things with the drives and stuff. And just this weekend, I was messing around, moving drives around, and experimenting with stuff. So I'm definitely the tinkerer. You know, I'm kind of the guy who who likes to have that equipment around, and I like to have the drives on site. But this would be, for, again, for me, thinking about this, would be a great solution because. To be honest, most of the drives, so I probably have, oh, just over a terabyte now of podcast metadata or um, data, you know, and, and I don't, I, I never access it, to be honest. It's just, it's just sitting there. It's sitting on this Drobo, right? And I don't really need, it doesn't need to be local because I don't mm -hmm. ever pull it down. So, I mean, that's a, that's a great scenario where. You're like, hey, a lot of these artifacts, I'm never going to come back to. If I needed it, I could get it, and I could get it fairly easily through the file system. Right. But it doesn't need to be sitting here, and I don't need to have a whole bunch. I mean, I have a little puck sitting here, so small that I was worried today. I thought I was going to have my daughter come turn it, because when Tony told me it was turned off, it's like, oh, crap, it's turned off. You know, Maybe I'll have my daughter come in and turn it on. I'm like, I'm not even sure she'll be able to find it. It sits, you know, I put it on my <laughs> desk, but it's back a ways, and I... You know, I put something on top of it, and it's like, I'm not sure I'd, I'd, I'd you know, be like, well, first of all, I could say, well, the computer on my desk. Well, great. There's four of them here. So, she, you know, that wouldn't help. Um, but it is, it is it's, a, it's a super small footprint. And, um, and you're right, just kind of disappears, you know. So, th yeah. that's pretty cool. I and low, low energy. Yeah, the, yeah, I think the, the, the most unique part of what we're doing is really the caching. Uh, the caching, you know, just allow you to be, uh, you know, to continue to, 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 to feel like, you know, you are using a NAS, yeah. right? And even with a group of users, that's the most unique part of what we are doing. And we just, you know, yeah, if you like tinkering, uh, you know, we don't let you tinker that much anymore. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know. You don't. You don't have to uh, swap out the drives and all that stuff. But that's but the fun on part. On the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, you know, we let you connect to Dropbox, yeah. uh, OneDrive, and all that stuff. And you know, through those those connections, you get all the apps that they have on those things. So you can you can continue to tinker with all those apps and all that stuff. A any thought yeah, to you want to. Any thought to configurable S3 locations? Uh, sometimes, you know, not everybody wants their data in the United States. And yeah, it's already there. Yeah. Well, it is today. But, 
can I, oh yeah 2.0 already has that okay good so i can configure where i'm sending it from a from yes we have customers uh, we have customers using the uk s3 bucket so so Aus yeah. australia etc there, there's a couple things you can do one is when you sign up for the morrow storage account you can specify where you want the morrow uh cloud storage which region you want to locate i think we support like six regions but you can also bring your own storage. And if you bring your own S3 storage, you can have that in whatever region you're in. There's a couple we don't support. We don't support China and yeah, we don't support, GovCloud. Yeah, we don't support China, Gov, um, and we don't support South America yet. Yeah. But you can bring, if you bring your own storage, you, you have a wide range of regions open. But right now, we do like the big places uh, UK, Australia, uh, Japan, Germany. Singapore, yeah, yeah, US. Just small. They may already have a relationship, and they just and they've got it in the right location. And especially from a data security standpoint, of like, hey, with right. my customers' data, I need to be very careful about where it's actually landing, and so I need to specify where it's going to go. Yeah, right. Could yeah. I? Can Someone I asked do about regulation? Um, yes. Yeah, so, well, somebody asked about HIPAA. Um, how do you address reg uh, regulators like HIPAA? And some, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same standard answer that that all the other data providers give i mean we encrypt uh at rest in transit uh you know we have uh we do uh location aware permission like tony explained you know if you are say if you're off-site uh, if you are on uh, if you are remote then you don't have to be permitted to access the same files so we have a lot of those uh, permission controls that traditional NAS or cloud storage gives you. So, you know, <clears throat> so we have a lot of, uh, we are very, we are very security aware. Yeah, I think in this day and age can have to be, right? I don't think you get very far if you're not. So good. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you again for, for coming. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I really appreciate your time and, uh, and thanks for, um, thanks for coming on tonight in a very, you know, lo we love storage. So even though we store way more than we're supposed to, we're all data hoarders. And, uh, in, you know, you think, wow, we have way, way more data than we probably should. This is a very, very fun discussion. So Tony, Paul, thank you for coming on and for hanging around so late and, uh, I make it out to that to the Bay Area. I'll have to swing by. We definitely want to have you back on at some point. The Dennis said uh, in the chat he would hope you guys would come back. So definitely think okay. about when yeah, it makes sure. sense and don't be bashful. Just just some you know say hey it's time and uh, we'll we'll get you scheduled to come back in. I will get this boxed up and and, uh, and mailed back out to you too to to get it back. Thanks for the thanks. So when you get the T nine hundred. Uh, I definitely <laughs> want to take a look. <laughs> definitely want to take a look at <laughs> when, when you make that All one. Right. All right, guys. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for coming on. Thank you again, Jim. We enjoyed it. You bet. You bet. It was great. And Paul, it was great to meet you as well. Great stories. I appreciate it. And and Tony, thanks for uh, uh, pulling this all together. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Appreciate thanks for having us. So. All right, guys. Uh, I'll let you drop. I'm going to let the audience go. Thanks for coming out tonight, guys. Appreciate it.